Welcome to This Week in Common Sense. My name is Timothy Verkula, and this podcast is Paul Jacobs' weekend podcast, wherein he recaps the big stories of the week as they've appeared at thisiscommonsense.org. Thisiscommonsense.org is where Paul has been writing since 1999. This week, Paul wrote five pieces as usual. Our elections, how broken? That's for Monday. Packing Unpacked, that's Tuesday. On Wednesday, he published Feckless Endangerment. On Thursday, F Book Goes Meta. And Friday, the day we are recording this podcast, Farming is Fundamental. So what does Paul want to talk about? I want to start with a quote. I want to bookend with quotes. And when you say quotes, you're talking about the pieces we put up as thoughts for the day. Thought of the day, yes, sir. The first one is by John Adams, and he says there is danger from all men. Pretty categorical. The only maxim of a free government ought to be to trust no man living with power to endanger the public liberty. In other words, if they've got power, to cause problems, don't trust them. There's an awful lot of governments throughout the world of all different kinds, and none of them seem to go out of their way to say, hey, remember, don't trust us. We can't be trusted. And it is kind of a, you know, there's a, there's a level of thoughtfulness when People, because, you know, John Adams was a politician. And, and uh, one of the beauties that I think sometimes gets lost, one of the beauties of our founders, you know, we, we, we've analyzed that they've made some mistakes and, and indeed they did. Uh, but one of the beauties is that they had a, a sophisticated sense of what, politics was about that you weren't going to just make everybody perfect like so often we hear today you know we just need to get a handle on corruption we've got to wipe out corruption and you know corruption isn't so easy to wipe out anytime someone has access to the loot in one way or another and nobody's watching them there's a lot of temptation. And yes, indeed, there are some people who will look around and realize no one's watching. I could grab all this dough and they won't do it. And that's wonderful. But there's a lot of people who will, most people, and even a lot of the good people, they won't do it the first time or the second or the 4,282nd. But the 4,283rd, they might. They might start to change if it just is so that everybody's doing it, you know, if you're in Washington. Um, and, and the corruption, you know, it's not like there's some magic potion in Washington. So in other words, what John Adams is saying is a, a basic kind of Christian, and, and I suspect every other philosophy too, attitude of we're sinners. We're fallible with a capital F. And, uh, and, and that's, that's a wise place to start in a system in which by law, by shaming, by, you know, whatever, we're going to somehow usher in a world where there's no corruption is silly. And, and the truth is, it is a man closer to the ancient man, maybe, the, uh, the, the framers of the Constitution in the late 1700s, who are the more sophisticated, and it is modern man who is naive. And naivety uh, leads to tyranny, so it's not good. Well, as you were talking about this big F word, uh, I noticed that we have three pieces this week that start with the letter F. So that was, that's my big contribution. In, including one, which is F book goes meta, about Facebook, where we, where of course F book means Facebook, or as we point out in that script, fraud book, 
or, or you know, just go with whatever you think. <laughs> but anyway, let's start on Monday and we'll be very chronological, very calendaristic. Uh, I don't know if that's a word, but what the heck? Uh, and Monday we talked about our elections, how broken. And it's interesting, uh, since Monday, uh, the Democrats have kind of kept trying to pass this uh, For the People Act. And when they say for the people, they mean for the people who have D by their name and are inside the Capitol, uh, for the people like them. And the For the People Act basically is a federal takeover of state elections. And it does things like, well, this, this, is, this is so emblematic of it that uh, maybe I'll just let this be the, the lone statement on it. Around the country, uh, a lot of states are, have voter ID, others are looking to do voter ID, and full disclosure, I'm working with another number of people in a number of states to pass voter ID laws that actually require people to show voter ID and also make it free and so on and so on. And of course, months ago, early in the summer, I think it was, when all of a sudden there was a big to-do because <clears throat> finally there was some news about the fact that even though Democrats constantly call voter ID laws suppression and racism and, you know, if you're for them, you're a white supremacist, turns out that somewhere in the order of 75, 80, 84 percent of, of, in different polls, uh, and it has been as high as 84 percent of minorities, people of color, saying they support voter ID laws. Um, <clears throat> and, and then all of a sudden the Democrats said, oh, we've always been for them. But the interesting thing is the For the People Act actually makes every national, national voter ID law and just supersedes all the state laws and puts a national law in place, a national voter photo ID law that just stops short of doing one thing. It stops short of requiring a photo ID. In other words, the idea behind voter ID, at least for, you know, kind of, you know, people like you and I and our, our listeners who aren't as sophisticated, our idea of photo, photo ID laws would be that the voter would have to show a photo ID. And of course, under the federal law, they would, but if they can't, well, then they can sign something, they can, you know, they can do... You know, they can show a, a rent payment or a, and, and so in essence, it's billed as photo voter photo ID when it preempts that requirement to make it to where no state could actually require you to show a photo ID. This is Washington. I mean, this is this is it's one thing to this isn't even a lie. It's like it's beyond lying. This is like meta lying or uh, uber lying or something. And uh, so that's the sort of thing they do. But this this piece on on Monday, and I encourage people to go to this is common sense.org, our elections, how broken. But John Fund, who's uh, who's a buddy of mine, I haven't talked to him in a couple of years with this pandemic, but uh, uh, was a big uh, uh writer about term limits. He was at the Wall Street Journal, which has been a very supportive on term limits. Of course, he wrote a book called Cleaning House uh, with James Coyne, who was a former congressman. And uh, so Fund, John Fund is, has written about all kinds of issues. And, and uh, I think he's a tremendous writer who I happen to agree with politically, you know, kind of all down the line, uh, super guy. He has written quite a bit about voter fraud. And in a recent book, he tells the story of an effort to investigate New York City, and they've had all kinds of problems. And of course, last week, we spent a good bit of time talking about New York City, because we were talking about the fact that they just decided to add 800,000 plus non-citizens to the voting rolls in New York City. And uh, so, but Fun points out that they, they had these investigators who basically went in to see if they could register to vote and vote, even though they were giving completely phony uh, names and information and everything else. And, and, and basically going to vote for people who were dead, who were incarcerated, who had moved out of the state, that sort of thing. And 
in every single case but one, they were successful. In the one case that they weren't successful, they were impersonating a person who was in jail. And the election official just said, look, I know you're not my son, and therefore <laughs> you're busted. That's the one case where it didn't work was the completely unbelievable coincidence that the person they were impersonating who would happen to be incarcerated was the son of the election official that they attempted to impersonate uh, that son in front of. Anyway, whatever. Hopefully I got all those words, just kind of push them together there and, and make sense of them. But uh, the, so what would you think would happen? You would think people go, look, Maybe, you know, we're not, no one's alleging that elections have been completely changed and that there have been zillions of votes and everything, but clearly we've got a very permeable barrier against fraud here and we need to, you know, shore some things up. But that's not what happened. What happened is that the people investigating they attempted to go after them in all kinds of ways as if they were committing some kind of crime and they were not committing a crime. They did not, you know, I mean, they had full authorization to do what they were doing. And we see this again and again and again. And, and years ago, I've been involved in the initiative and referendum process and petitions. And, you know, people have charged fraud, there's fraud and therefore we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And oftentimes, they are playing up fraud way beyond what exists. But it would be foolish to suggest that none exists or that there's no reason to be concerned about fraud. And the truth is the problem with their argument is one that they're hyping the fraud way beyond, but the other is that their solutions don't really fight the fraud, they're designed to kneecap the process. And so it's not that we argue, oh, there's never any fraud, so why should we even care? What we argue is what you're trying to do is not help fight fraud. You're trying to destroy the process. And of course, the fraud, uh, both the fact that there's none, oh, it's no problem. You know, these are not the drones you're looking for. That's the Democrats line. And of course, Republicans, I don't suggest that you go and just, hey, oh, if the Republicans said it, we can trust that. No reason to, you know, no reason to double check the fine print. The truth is Republicans and Democrats representing us in public office. Let's remember Adam's comments should not be trusted, should not be trusted, should not be trusted. And that means we need to look and see what they're doing. Anytime we can put these rules in the Constitution, and not in statutory law, we should do so, so that any time they want to change it, they have to come back and ask us, not just ask us, ask us, and then we get to say yay or nay. And so this, these, this is really, all of this talk about elections and democracy, and oh, the Democrats, we have to save democracy from the Republican state legislatures, at the same time that they're trying to just mandate everything nationwide, and that many of these Republican state legislatures have rules that are just leaps and bounds better than the blue state rules in New York or Delaware or California or Washington state. And so it's, it's we, have to, we have to realize we're not going to get the, state, the, the straight dope from the media either. They're not going to, I mean, I read article after or article about this For the People Act, and all we, all you hear is that so-and-so who's a voting rights advocate likes it and doesn't like the Republican stuff, and after all, a voting rights advocate, so this is someone who likes voting rights, and I mean, it's all jargon and jaundice language designed not to explain any of the of the you know different aspects and different provisions but instead to just basically say this is democracy this is good see the white hat 
And this is bad, evil suppression. See the black hat. And uh, they're, they'll keep coming. And, and uh, it, it's a huge, huge problem because none of the real problems ever get fixed. They're just going to put different things on top of it. And um, I think the worst of all outcomes is a federal takeover because then just like so much there's just one, there, there, there's no laboratories of democracy. There's no way to, to try different things. My daughter, who's, uh, who's home from uh, college, uh, she's actually in first year graduate school and, and uh, was talking about this, this uh, TED talk where the woman, and was talking more about the way people see Africa as a single, uh, her, her argument was, the idea of a single story, when you see something, a, a country, a people, as a single story, like they're all this, you know, this is the story that defines them. That's not a good thing. And, and yet, that's what we're getting in the arguing behind this, uh, no, no analysis, no debate back and forth, but that the For the People Act, or the John Lewis Act, uh, which, of course, John Lewis is deceased, and this act is much different than the act that he actually supported when he was alive. And uh, but we get one story about that. And then we also, if it passes, in another sense, are going to have one story about our elections. So if they fail, they fail everywhere at the same time. And if someone has a better idea, you're not going to see it implemented and be able to judge it against other states because of course they're all gonna be the same and they're all gonna be dictated from Washington DC. So there's a lot going on on this whole issue. And frankly, the media tells us almost nothing about it, almost nothing. And what they do tell us is largely lies and spin designed to fool us. So it's not always lies. Sometimes it's just spin designed to fool us. So, you know, there's there's the two things, bad and worse. Well, that sort of reminds me of um, the uh, pandemic where we're told one story. <laughs> the one <laughs> size fits all. You're supposed to get vaccinated. That's the, that's the answer. And uh, whereas medically, the truth is not ever mentioned by on the news. And the truth is that there are, the most important thing a person can do with this new disease, COVID, is get early treatment with a variety of vitamins and drugs and things like that. Yes. They know what to do. There's a, a number of things to be done. There's a number of, you know, the, what do they call them, protocols. Uh, but uh, right. all the government really wants to tell us is to get vaccinated. That's the only interesting thing that the government says. Yes. yes. So it's just, a, it's, you know, that's the thing about politicians in Washington, D.C. is they seem to want to have everything solved by Washington, D.C. Why? I don't know, because it, it so rarely works. And of course, again and again, it has the opposite impact because we recognize they're lying. So they're going to just tell us the same thing over again and just browbeat us that, oh, oh, you, you have antibodies naturally? We don't want to listen to your question. Just shut up and take the vaccine. Um, do you need a booster shot? Well, we said something about a booster shot. So of course you need one and you must have it right now. You know, the, the Met in New York City is requiring that not only you be vaccinated, you could be vaccinated and have a thing showing you don't have COVID taken an hour before that. You also now have to have the booster. And so it's just this, it's this maze where you have to constantly kind of re-up to be part of this new society, it's it really has gotten to be insane. And it's also pretty clear that they continue to talk about these vaccines as if they're miracles. And I'm not, I'm not dumping on them. Look, we'll find out exactly what how much they work or how much they don't work. I don't have a vaccine that works. So it's not like I'm going, hey, I got you beat, medical science. It's just that. If you put it out there as if everyone got vaccinated, it would all be solved. And the whole problem are people who don't get vaccinated or who didn't get boosted or who didn't get boosted six times today. You're full of it because we know that if everyone gets vaccinated, it's still there's it's still going on. People are still getting it who are vaccinated. And and of course, 
again, the, I'm not making an argument that, hey, here's all the science and I know exactly what's what. I'm making the argument that we're being lied to again. We're being lied to again. We get lied to about everything. It, it seems that it's important that they lie to us about virtually everything. But back to your theme of uh, just a centralized one solution and politicians are all behind it or one group of politicians all behind it. Uh, that's, is that a theme? That was a theme, I think. You're a Tuesday piece. Pat the theme is don't trust politicians. And, and Tuesdays, you're right, is right up this alley. You know, and we've talked about this quite a bit, Tim, and it's pretty obvious where the public is. If Democrats thought it was popular, this is packing unpacked. And basically, we just are commenting on the fact that the, this commission that Biden set up to look at court packing, which is just adding judges, there's nothing that stops the Congress from adding 10 new Supreme Court justices and having Biden uh, appoint them all and put them on the court right now. And this 6-3 Republican majority would all of a sudden be a 13 to 6 Democratic majority. There's nothing politically that stops that if Democrats go that route. What stops that is the fact that the American public would just be aghast at the idea that this court that's always been independent has just been completely hijacked by those who are in power. Look, there's all kinds of things and we can we can argue what was right or what was wrong. Nothing, nothing stops. Nothing stopped the Republicans from not putting somebody on the court, Merrick Garland, who Obama uh, nominated. And I'm glad they didn't put him on the court, but I would have brought him up and voted him down. I would not have blocked him in that way. I just don't think it's the right way to do it. Again, it's not, you know, this isn't a crime against humanity, but what it shows is that our system isn't established as solidly as it should be. And shouldn't Congress say, hey, come on, we want a system that works for everybody. It's not, we don't want a system where the first person to cheat gets a huge advantage. The first person to get rid of the filibuster can then just pass everything with, when it's a 50-50 Congress, can pass things that no Congress, a 59-41 Congress was never able to pass before. And I'm, when I say Congress, I'm talking about Senate here. And, and Look, I, I kind of like the filibuster, but I'd be okay with not having it too. I can argue both ways. I can see advantages here or there. Um, I tend to prefer it, but I want it to be part of the Constitution. I don't want it to be a political weapon that one party can use against the other. And frankly, it doesn't matter which party. I mean, you know, whatever particular issue, if it's your party, you might like what's going to happen on that issue. But we all have to recognize that it's, you know, you're just watching our system of checks and balances fade away. And so that's more important. It's the same sort of thing that, you know, in some states, uh, uh, I, I was really glad when Republican legislatures had the wherewithal to say, no, we're not going to expand Medicaid. Uh, the federal government wants us to spend a bunch of money, and then there's no guarantee down the road that they're going to pay everything. And we're not creating, you know, this great big bigger welfare state well in initiative states you know the folks who wanted that got wise after a while and they got some money together and uh they put those on the ballot and they passed them people you know there, there was enough folks to say hey yes yeah, send me the the free money and um and so that happened now almost every state that did that the legislature that was a republican legislature then went to try to how can we wreck the initiative process in so some way that without repealing it you know if we repeal it there'd be a big big fuss but how can we wreck it so that they can't so easily use it ever again that's not really the right way to do it the right way to do it would be to say well if we want to change that policy let's come up with a better vision that people can can ascribe to let's not destroy the building blocks of citizen control of government and instead that's what they that's what they like to do so anyway it's it's the same sort of thing with the court packing this is this is you know we have a system so many places in the world somebody takes over the government 
And then the Supreme Court says they can do this and they can do that because the Supreme Court's in their back pocket. And as bad as our courts are and as bad as our whole government is, our courts, I think, at the federal level are the only branch of government that's at all functioning in any decent way. And I say that having lost a bunch of cases in federal court, it's not like I love them because they've always ruled my way. I just see them as more independent. And this court packing that it's been discussed and, and the only thing that stopped it is the public disgust over the idea and that they know it would be unpopular. But if you think about it, one of the signs of how free a society you have, one of the signs to determine that is how much can the government do that's completely unpopular? And sometimes there's talk about like a Bloomberg, former New York City mayor and otherwise idiot, uh, Michael Bloomberg, would always talk about China and how, well, you know, Mao has to answer, or Mao, I say Mao, Xi Jinping is who I meant, but same guy, basically. <laughs> you know, Xi Jinping's a little slimmer, but that's about it. Anyway, uh, and maybe a little smarter and more dangerous. Uh, but it was always that somehow he, his public opinion was going to require that he had to do certain things. I mean, it's the same stupid stuff that so many people in the West have said for decades as the Chinazis got stronger and stronger and, and were facilitated and subsidized by you and I. Um, but anyway, that's that whole idea that, that somehow people are going to be held, you know, our, our politicians, they won't do that because we'll be mad. Well, there are times we see that that's exactly true and it's heartening and it's comforting and it, and it should cause us to double down on we need to be agitating and keeping them scared. When you think about the kind of lockdowns that they've had in China, you know, we've had lockdowns in Australia and New Zealand and the United States and they've been sickening and, and outrageously tyrannical. And, and I'm not for, you know, I'm not for being uh, silly and, uh, and, and not paying attention to a pandemic, but there are certain rights that people have and governments are not given just carte blanche power to do whatever they want. But of course in China, they were literally welding doors of buildings shut and doing you know, all kinds of things. Why? And it's not like they can do anything. If they started just massacring everybody at some point, maybe there would be a revolt, but the level of what it takes for there to be a revolt, uh, the level of control they have of that society, it's not as if it's, you know, oh, we just found out, oh, we just took a poll. The Chinese people don't like being welded into their apartment buildings. Uh, you know, that's not quite how it works. And we need to make sure that we never get to that point here where when we're all upset, you know what? Sometimes it just doesn't matter that we're all upset because they don't give a damn and because they don't think we have any way to take away their power. So um, anyway, this, this sort that, that they're even talking about this is outrageous and that there's no real push to fix this issue. This Because the issue isn't that the court is now 6-3 Republican. That's come over literally 30, 40 years. I mean, what, what's never said is that Republican presidents were nominating people who turned out to be super liberal. I don't know why Republicans always elected presidents who screwed them when it came to the Supreme Court. Trump, surprisingly, who I expected to nominate very liberal judges, uh, turned out to be the best uh, nominator of Supreme Court justices in my lifetime. But this has happened over time, and it's part of the fiber of our independent judiciary that doesn't get yanked around for politics every time there's an election. And I'm, I am for term limits, uh, and we've written quite a bit. If you go to thisiscommonsense.org, uh, this is packing, uh, what, is, what is it? Uh, packing, packing unpacked. unpacked. Uh, but we've written quite a bit if, if you put Supreme Court term limits in. Uh, about this issue. I love lifetime tenure. I'm a big term limits guy, but for the federal judiciary and frankly at the state level, I think they ought to be looking at more of that type of system because it's work to create independent judiciary. 
Uh, at the Supreme Court, though, I think there's just too much power there, and there needs to be a term limit, 12 years, 16 years, 18. Uh, that's the sort of, of limit that I think you want there, because I don't think you want people wielding that kind of power for very long. Um, and I think it would also make sense to do it on a rotation basis. So you don't have, have two Supreme Court justice, you know, or, or three Supreme Court justices, uh, you know, killed somehow in the same month. And now some president has a third of the court that he's nominating that you would on a regular basis, instead of allowing the vagaries of death, and life and death to determine it, that you'd every, because you have set terms, you'd have a rotation where each president would probably nominate two or one or whatever. That would require also having uh, appointments for temporary to fill in because if somebody did die, then you wouldn't want to upset the, uh, the, uh, the rotation. You would have to have temporary positions. So you'd have somebody in that can't be reappointed. Yes, that, that is probably the way, exactly the way you would do it. And that would be, a, you know, that would be a fly in the ointment on how you, how you do that. But, you know, we're not going to get rid of death, unfortunately, or, although, you know, it'd be good to legislate on it. Uh, but, uh, but I'm kidding. Uh, I'm sure they would if they thought they could and then blame somebody for it not working out. Well, um, the opposite party who the, the, <laughs> all be ascribed to the opposite party that year. They, they hadn't funded it strongly enough. Wednesday... We took on the Olympics and there, there, there's something that's going on. People, a lot of times they think of sports and they don't think of business and sports is a big business. There's millions of dollars being made. And even in amateur, so it used to be amateur and now it's still largely sort of almost amateur Olympic competition. I'm not sure that it's amateur at all, but anyway, it's more of a, you know, good feelings in sports and we're doing all kinds of different things. Well, in the last month or so, uh, when it Peng Shu, uh, and I don't think it is, it, I, I think I probably butchered the last name, but the, the uh, Chinese uh, tennis player, and it's actually her first name, but the Chinese tennis player who alleged that a former vice minister, pretty high up uh, communist in the Chinese Communist Party had uh, sexually assaulted her and harassed her for years and so on and so on. She got scrubbed from the, uh, my voice is changing. Anyway, she got scrubbed from the uh, uh, internet very quickly in China. There was a lot of concern. The Women's Tennis Association, we've written about this, uh, uh, a Women's Tennis Association, to its credit, came out and said, look, we are going to pull stuff from China if you can't guarantee uh, this tennis player's safety. We're not going to send other tennis players there if, if, they, if we you know, can't be confident that they're going to be safe. And, uh, and then the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, held a video call with her and there were some other photos and so on and you know and they said basically that we're doing the quiet diplomacy while the WTA is doing the the louder diplomacy now the IOC is basically bought and paid for by the Chinese Communist Party and so they weren't doing any quiet diplomacy um, that's called betrayal uh, that's called collusion. Uh, and the IOC is a, basically a pretty evil organization that cares about making money. And other than that, kind of leans toward dictators over regular people, especially athletes who dictators might want to stomp on. And, uh, and so Mr. Biden, our, our commentary, uh, which is feckless endangerment, uh, Biden has decided there's going to be a diplomatic boycott of the Olympic Games. And, um, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't know all the rules for how the Olympics gets done and who gets to decide. And I, I understand that the U.S. government can say, nope, no athletes can go and so on. And, and I'm not sure that really the government should have the power to say somehow you can't go to an athletic competition you want to go. But of course, maybe you couldn't represent the United States of America there. Um, but at the end of this piece, 
I basically ask people to do the right thing and to tell the world why. And I, and I don't mean just governments to do the right thing, but for athletes to make a statement and a sacrifice of not going and maybe getting whatever fame or glory you might get because you don't want to go and help people who are basically doing, you know, we talk about China as a, they're engaged in a genocide against the Uyghurs. They're also engaged in what is now a largely successful genocide against Falun Gong, the, the spiritual movement that they just stomped on and murdered and are now still selling body parts of. Um, and you can go to, you know, uh, this is com uh, this is commonsense.org and, and uh, Google all that and, and the, the uh, commentaries are there with links to the, to the evidence. Uh, and of course, there's the continuing thing on Tibet. And I'm sure, uh, Tim, you'll put up the, the uh, uh, I think, incredibly powerful graphic that uh, Jim Gill put together. Uh, hard to watch. Uh, when I posted this on my, uh, you know, it, it's striking. Um, when I posted this on my personal Facebook page, it was processing. I tried to uh, post it and it's, it just was processing. And they did not, it still isn't up. It's still processing and they, they have a little note on it that says, uh, this usually happens when someone uh, deletes it, I didn't delete it, or put it to a different uh, group. I had it public the whole time. I think they saw the picture and they thought this is too political or something. And it had words with it. So then I posted just the picture, no words with it. And that got through. And then when I got through, I went to that and put the words with it. Um, but what's interesting about that to me is we have this major communications device in our country now and in much of the world. Not in China, because of course they censor it, but, uh, but in much of the world. And it makes it very difficult to talk about what tyrannies do and about uh, governments and about medicine and about, it makes it tough to talk about all those things. If you wanna put a picture of your cat or your dog or your kid or your mother or your grandmother or whoever, then you can do that. If you want to say everything's rosy and sweet and I love my Fuhrer, then you can say that. But if you want to say, wait a second, there's been a mistake here. Um, what our government's telling us is a lie or look at these pictures. And of course here, there, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing that anyone would say was obscene about these pictures, except that they do show people being hung, which is what happens a lot when you have authoritarian regimes and you have people who say, no, I want to be free. I want to speak out. They hang them or they put them in concentration camps or they beat them to death or all kinds of those things. And if we don't get to talk about it, that's a problem. That's a big problem. And so this is a, this is a post that you know, it's not as if anyone's going to go, well, did you hear about uh, some guy in Virginia named Paul Jacob? His post was delayed and, and he had to go. It's not the biggest deal in the world, is it? No, not really. Except when you start to build on it and realize it's going on for everybody all over. This is insane. This is something that, that 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we would have gone in, you know, people would have been apoplectic that they can't say certain things. Um, this is a huge problem. And of course, I still, when I look at my Facebook page, and we did a commentary uh, about this weeks ago, I'm still under restricted status because I was part of the Punjab Referendum Commission. And I posted pictures of a meeting that was held in a, in a British government building with full, you know, it's not like we snuck in or anything. I mean, it's, it's, this is, you know, it was a very public 
referendum. I understand the Indian government doesn't like what they're doing. We don't take any position on it. They asked us to monitor their election and to report on it and to advise them. And we're doing that. And we're doing it in what we think is a very objective and fair way, both to them and to everybody else. And, uh, and yet Facebook, you know, boom, I'm in, in trouble somehow. And, if, and here's the other interesting thing. No way to, and, and, you know, they'll say, well, did you object? Did you get the thing that said, here's where you can protest it? Nothing, nothing. And I've talked to a lot of other people who, it, you know, you're in this, in this cyber, you know, isolation. There's no way that I have sent several messages to Facebook, but all of them attempting to contact them, not with them contacting me. And of course, I was restricted in the sense that they say I can't go live. Well, I don't think I've ever gone live. Um, you know, we record stuff, we do different things, but I haven't gone live on Facebook and, and have no plans to. And the other thing is that I can't advertise personally. Well, you know, I do have groups that have advertised on Facebook and other places, although I'm less inclined to, uh, but, but, but I've never advertised personally. So it's not that gee, this is crushing me. They're, they're devastating me in some way. It's a little button that it even says on it, only you can see this. Only you know that big brother is waiting to choke you and silence you. This is not the way Americans are supposed to live. And it's not the way anybody's supposed to live. Now, on Common Sense with Paul Jacob Facebook page, which uh, I put it up, and it's there, had no problem, but there's no likes. There's only 41 people reached and one engagement. And it's down and admits that the distribution score is 8.5 times lower than usual. Everything else is a like on the page. You know, the thoughts of a day have likes. There's uh, most of these things, most of these things have 160 people reached or more. I mean, it's just, it's, so obviously they squelched it in some way. Yes, I've had the same thing on, on Chinese script sometimes, if I'm talking about China. This is a Chinese script. Well, it is, that's right, that's right. It's obviously China looms large over uh, Facebook's policies. Well, and this is, this is something I've heard from all kinds of people who talk about China. And, and I watch, uh, uh, and I'll give them a plug, uh, China Uncensored, which I, I think the guy has a, you know, he's kind of got a dad sense of humor. So, so I, find it, I find it appealing, but it, I think he's got a good sense of humor and it's a lot of, of good information. But the podcast is, uh, which is on YouTube, that's where I see it, is called China Uncensored. And they're constantly talking about, you know, uh, you know, we're, we get hit with all kinds of problems and they, all of a sudden we have a video and it doesn't go anywhere. And, and, uh, and that's not the only one that, that I've, I've heard that same complaint on. So, um, this, you know, it, it's scary to kind of be in this type of situation. And of course, it, you also have the places like, uh, where was it in, in, uh, was it, uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm, Kashmir, Kashmir, uh, the region in, in uh, India where they basically shut down the internet for, I think, almost two months, that there basically was just no internet access. And, uh, you know, in the old days where you had mimeograph machines and stuff, somebody could go in their basement and print something out to give to people. But if there's, you know, no internet, uh, it's, it's, we've become very dependent on communications devices that it seems to me the government has more control of than past communications devices. And let's go back to John Adams. We can't trust them. Right. Did you uh, clarify for people what feckless endangerment was really about though, your piece? Because it's really about Biden's policy of making sure that government officials in America don't go to the, the, the games, right? Yes, and and, and, and they, idea. I mean, it's it's like no one cares, right? That it's these right, right. important. It's I mean, this could have been a funnier piece, I guess, if we just played up the silliness of it. But but well, we did we did make fun of a, a little bit here and there that uh, you know it's it's uh, you know what it, it's uh, it's the kind of thing where did did they really think that people were going to be so upset that somehow diplomats weren't there? I mean, it's the athletes they're watching, and so. Uh, it's 
it's it's a it's a way to say the words to get the photo op to get the boycott uh, word out there you mean to, to sound like you're standing up yes for- yes yeah, okay. and okay. and frankly i did a uh i did a piece not long ago uh and i can't remember exactly what the name of it was but if you it was on taiwan and and it was after uh biden had said some things about uh you know, we're going to defend Taiwan. We've made that commitment. And they, they, then they kind of walk that back because we have a strategic ambiguity. We somehow don't want to say. I made the point that not only I think we should say, and my view is we need to hold the line in Southeast Asia and, and uh, that, that the democracies of the world ought to recognize World War III is upon us if we show weakness to the Chinazis in the same way that the rest of Europe showed weakness to Hitler in the 1930s. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a big problem. But when I, when I wrote that script, one of the things I pointed out too was, it's, it's not about what our diplomats say. <laughs> we can't stop China because our diplomats gave a really good speech. We have to actually physically defend ourselves, defend Japan, defend South Korea, defend Australia, defend Taiwan. And someone from Taiwan, a friend of mine, sent something saying, you know, I'm glad you you went that extra step to point out we actually have to do that. Because, you know, the Chinese are not they're not stupid. They're very smart. They're very capable. This is not, um, you know, this is, I think we've, we've run around the world as the world's policeman for a long time. Uh, you know, fighting people like Grenada and, uh, and Iraq for that matter, Afghanistan. Um, we need to stop policing every hamlet and village and start defending ourselves And it seems to me that the best way to do that is in an alliance with other democracies. Those are already out there. So it's not like I'm suggesting we invent something new. I'm just suggesting that we concentrate on those alliances that actually keep millions of people free and that we stop running around to do stupid things in places where there's nobody free to begin with. In other words, one of the reasons not, not that I would choose Joe Biden or the current Joint Chiefs maybe to do uh, my withdrawal from Afghanistan, but one of the reasons that I wanted to be out of Afghanistan is we're not really producing, I mean, this is not somewhere where we're restoring freedom from people who've had it taken away. It's, it's not a free society. We couldn't make it into a free society. Uh, we, had, we had cause to go there to stop them from helping people who killed our people. But beyond that, it didn't make a lot of sense. And when you think about alliances, alliances should help us because we're all working together. And I think the the most frightening thing to China that's happened in the last year or so is the alliances that have sprung up uh, and Japan, you know, Japan, uh, what was it, maybe six, eight months ago, basically said uh, they view the defense of Taiwan, that they will help the United States in defending Taiwan, and that they view that any attack on Taiwan as an existential threat. And the response from China was, we will nuke you. We will attack you with nuclear weapons. We do make an exception and would strike first with nuclear weapons against Japan and repeatedly hit Japan with nuclear weapons. So it's, it's, I mean, I, I look at this happening, and I read so many different stories about this sort of thing. And it's always in this very highbrow diplomatic type language. There is a country with 1.4 billion people in nuclear weapons that is threatening to nuke people if they get in the way of them attacking murdering and taking over and subjugating and enslaving 24 million free people right now in Taiwan, um, who wants to take over the entire South China Sea. 
I mean, we should have called it something else because they think the whole darn thing is theirs. And that's not how things work internationally. And we really have a choice. And, and again, I'm, I don't make this choice for every American, but it seems like we ought to wake up to the fact that we have to make the choice some way or someone's gonna make it for us. And the choice is get the heck out of Asia entirely. Don't navigate, don't drive any ships, you know, don't, don't, don't steer any ships through the Taiwan Strait or through the South China Sea. That part of the world is verboten. Get the hell out. Or get ready to defend against Chinese aggression. And, and look, I think that if we're ready to defend against Chinese aggression, we may be able to stop it. To me, I want to see us be strong because I think that's the best, best path to avoid World War III. But it, it is, I think, just awfully scary uh, where we have gotten. And most of the, of the kind of tipping point fright in my mind is China having lots of reasons to think we're not fully serious. We're not fully prepared. We're asleep at the switch. It's kind of interesting that Facebook came an issue uh, in this discussing the last piece, uh, the Wednesday piece, when Facebook is the star of the show for um, the Thursday piece, F book goes meta. Yes, yes. And, and we had a little bit of, of fun with the, uh, the word meta, but this is all coming from uh, John Stossel. Stossel had posts that he had on Facebook that they fact-checked and said was somehow, you know, disinformation and, and he filed suit. I love it. And of course, we've done a, done a script on that prior to this and, and uh, brought it to our, our mass audience. Basically, in court, Facebook is now saying that their little fact checks, which are all over the place, anything that mentions COVID, even if it's like a completely extraneous point, has some stupid Facebook thing where you can get Facebook special, we know the truth information about COVID. It is a complete joke. And they go into court and they say basically that our fact checkers, this is just their opinion that this is that that what he said was untrue and everything is somebody's opinion. Then what the heck are they doing fact checking? How do you basically do a fact check and then say, oh, it's all opinion. It's got nothing to do with what's true or not true. This is, I, I, I need to uh, track down this ad that I've seen a couple of times uh, from Facebook where it has some, I don't know if it's an actor or a real, you know, live human being, it's probably a robot, but, but it, it sounds like a real human being who works for, for Facebook and works on figuring out whether they should, you know, censor or not. And he's very thoughtful and so on. And the reality is that almost all of it is ridiculous algorithms that are that are taking things that that are just completely silly, uh, and because of one phrase or one you know shade in some picture, are are causing a lot of problems. They don't have a lot of people doing it, and there's zero thoughtfulness, and so it's just it it's so obnoxious that um, you know censorship is bad if it's really well done, but this is joke censorship with one little aspect that's not funny. And that is that it is clearly aimed politically. This is not the Keystone cops just throwing, you know, shade over this post or that post. This is clearly a political agenda and Zuckerberg has a political agenda. And, and a lot of, you know, Twitter, it's not hard to see where Twitter's trying to take people. Um, and so it, it's, uh, this makes things much more difficult when you think about the fact that we, you know, we've always had to speak through the media when we're going to a mass audience. And, uh, and that puts certain restraints on what can be communicated. That's why it's so important that when, you know, social media got started, 
And now we see the we see the handcuffs on that as well. The third F title in a row for this week was Farming is Fundamental, and that's for today, Friday. Yes, and this is uh, this is about another uh, another uh, some more Fs. It's about a friend, a representative Falkingham, Billy Bob Falkingham, a uh, Republican in Maine, who's done stuff on citizen voting. Uh, has has a voter ID measure that he uh, pushed. Democrats blocked in Maine, but uh, uh, good measure, and uh, and was the author and and pushed this uh, right to to food amendment that passed last November in Maine. And I encourage you to come read the language. I think it's it's excellent language actually in terms of stating the right to be able to plant seeds and grow food and do things. And clearly putting it within restraints that uh, in, in ways that are respectful and, and follow laws regarding uh, private property and the environment, and natural resources, and so on. Uh, but what's so interesting to me is this is a useful amendment. I'm so glad that he pushed this and put it in the Constitution. And on the other hand, it's kind of depressing that we that we feel the need, and I think it's a correct, it's an, a, a kind of a correct analysis of where we are politically, that we need to put things in the Constitution that say, yes, we have a right to grow food. Yes, we have a right to, you know, have livestock. Yes, we have a right to do this. Um, and the reason is, because the regulatory state has so much power that if we don't restate those rights, I think we're looking at a situation in which courts are thinking, well, you know, there's, it, you know, there's a, a compelling state interest to make everything clean and healthy and wonderful. And even though these regulations never achieve any of that, somebody once said they might, so that's good enough. And so they have all kinds of power and there's no rights really being trampled on. So, so in our little cost benefit analysis, all we're weighing is the government's desire to tell us what to do because they know best. And this is a big pushback against that. And I think we're gonna see these sorts of things happen in other places. And when you think about it, what do we, you know, well, when would the government ever stop anybody from doing anything? Well, I know most of the people listening uh, are not thinking that because they know there's all kinds of cases. But think about things like raw milk that has been a big deal that we bring up in this in this script, where you know all kinds of things that people want to do, they want to buy raw milk. Someone wants to sell it to them. You know, if raw milk was so bad for you and killed everybody, we wouldn't be here because for hundreds of years that's how that's how it kind of worked. So it's, it's, it's these sorts of common sense things that we now have to put into law. And, and, you know, we can bemoan it, but let's not spend too much time bemoaning it. Let's put it into law. And so I, I salute uh, Representative Billy Bob Falkingham in Maine for doing it. And it, it leads me to another quote we had this week, another thought of the day. This one from George Washington. And I really liked it. And the more I think about it, the more I like it. Liberty, when it begins to take root, is a plant of rapid growth. That's what the father of our country said. And I think he's right. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, on the one hand, if you, if you use these as bookends, which is kind of what I've done here. Oh, I've, I've got it all figured out. Anyway, if you use these as bookends, on the one hand, going in and thinking about what sort of government we ought to have, we have to remember, not because we're great people and they're terrible people, but because we're all people, that those who hold power in government can not be trusted. We have to remember that. And the good news is, let's, let's not worry too much about freedom, because the more you give people freedom, the more they want it, 
And the more we've seen in this beautiful land of ours, with all the good and the bad and the mistakes, the more people have freedom, the more they produce, the more abundance there is, the more people who may be just washed up on the, on the shore from somewhere else where they had no freedom can get into the mix of things. And now they're making it and they're free and they're producing. And then, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, this is good stuff. We ought to, we ought to, uh, we ought to kind of, kind of salute freedom more often. It, it, you know, years ago, I remember thinking you never hear anybody in politics even mention it. It's all about what the government can do, what we can do, that you deserve this and you deserve that and everybody ought to have this and we can produce, you know, when you have a right to housing and a right to medicine and very little common sense understanding that this is a dangerous operation we're engaged in. We can't give it too much power and very little realization that the driver of what's, you know, the, the reason the, the America can be a force for good in the world, the reason that, that we can help poor people in our own country is because we've produced abundance. And that didn't happen because the government did it. It happened because people like you and I did it. Well, it sounds like we have finished an episode of This Is Common Sense. This podcast is called This Week in Common Sense, but Every one of your columns, and especially when you read them on the radio, ends with, this is common sense. I'm Paul Jacob. That's what it, every one of them ends that way. Yes. It's your tagline. Uh, you should say that to end this episode. Maybe you should end the, every episode of this podcast with those very words. Well, this is 100% common sense. Everything I've said is common sense. And I'm Paul Jacob. This has been This Week of Common Sense for the second full week of December 2021. My name is Timothy Verkula. I help Paul every weekend doing this podcast. Please look for us on Rumble and subscribe, on YouTube and subscribe, and SoundCloud and subscribe, and comment. But how do you get to all those places? This is commonsense.org. That's probably the place to go. Just go to thisiscommonsense.org. Paul writes a column five days a week, has been doing so since 1999.